Uh, hello and welcome everyone to our monthly WFO webinar. My name is Ilya Kanulhov and I'm the development manager at the World Forum of Showwind. Today's WFO webinar is on of Showwind development challenges. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome our three excellent speakers for today. We have David uh, Car uh, Carascosa, the director of operation at SciTech. We have Felix Fisher, a partner at Chatham Partners, and Yuka Toma, a project development team leader at Renova. And besides from the Nova team, we have um, Masahira Yoshida and Nail Maybe from the Renova team. Uh, and they will join us later during the Q&A session. So, and before we, we jump into the presentation, let me say uh, a few things about WFO. Um, WFO was uh, uh, founded in 2018 and we're a nonprofit entity focused on onshore wind energy only, promoting onshore uh, offshore wind energy worldwide and our members represent the complete offshore wind value chain. We have an international setup with offices in Hamburg, Tokyo, Taipei, and New York. Uh, in terms of our activities, uh, it's very straightforward as we focus on three things. We lobby for offshore wind around the world, we inform about offshore wind via our media channels, and we connect the global offshore wind community by doing events. And in terms of members, uh, we're very happy to have a broad range of global members from around the world. At the moment, we have uh, over 70 members, and we're delighted to have companies from all segments of the value chain, from North America, Europe, Asia, and even Australia. And if you're not our member yet, uh, please make sure to join us and uh, feel free to contact our, uh, our managing director, Gunnar Herzig. And if you have any questions regarding the membership, please do not his, uh, hesitate to reach us. And before we jump uh, into the presentation, with the presentation, let me say a few words about the structure of the webinar, which is actually very simple. During the first half of the event, uh, David, Felix, and Yuka will present on the topic. And during the second part of the webinar, they will answer to your questions. So each attendee can ask a question using the chat function on your control panel on the right and site. So without any further ado, uh, Felix, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'll quickly um, open my presentation. Um, well, thanks a lot, Ilya, for the introduction and thanks uh, to the WFO for hosting this, uh, uh, this series. Uh, very glad to speak here today on this interesting topic with those very distinguished colleagues. Um, Development challenges for offshore wind. I mean, I think um, one needs to focus on something in this realm because it's quite broad. I'll get <laughs> to try to give an overview from our perspective. Um, and I have focused on um, certain areas, uh, the, uh, the field of uh, spatial availability and area. Um, and before I go in, however, uh, a couple of words on, um, on myself and on our firm. Um, we are a boutique law firm um, based in Hamburg. Um, founded some five years ago, and uh, we have a strong focus on project development, particularly in the renewable energy space, and um, also particularly in the offshore wind sector that we've been very active in for more than 10 years now as individuals. And um, we advise a large um, number of uh, project developers and operators in the German um, space, but also in some instances internationally. And so we Project development is what we do, and so uh, we like to shed some light on some challenges that we've come across and that we hope can also um, give some ideas and inspirations and thoughts for the international context. So, as I said, uh, we're going um, to we're going to focus on area use and space. Don't read through all the bullet points. It's mostly about the questions of co-utilization of different uh, purposes of uh, the EEZ. Um, then uh, cumulative effects of increasing build out and also the need for cross border coordination um, um, in the um, especially in the North Sea in Europe but also in other places where um, uh, where waters are used by more than one nation uh, currently or in the future and um, looking at this as a holistic area. So if one speaks about development challenges, we first of all have to think about what is the development that we see ahead and what is uh, what is lying ahead of the industry. And um, 
I think it's uh, quite uh, quite uh, unprecedented uh, that uh, the industry is facing the huge ambition and expectation that it is at the moment. So if we look at the um, at the development in the past up, up to this year, last year, we see a steady but modest uh, modest growth that already um, provided quite some challenges for the uh, scaling up of the industry, of the technical the, uh, technological development, and, um, and also on where those projects are realized. But if we see and have now pictures, one particularly ambitious forecast here that heads for 2000 gigawatt by 2050, we see that um, uh, there will have to happen a rapid in, in increase in speed and in deployment of the, uh, of the technology in order to um, keep up with those ambitions and goals. And well aware that there are other um, goals and thoughts about how much um, there is going to be in the waters by 2030 and by 2050. But I mean, everything has in common that uh, offshore wind needs a significant further rollout in several areas. And, um, and so the ambition is huge. And in the past, and also um, we see that going forward, probably the larger um, issue is going to be the um, delivery on those targets and ambition rather than uh, the ambition itself. And, one of the questions uh, related to that is the use of space, and um, but there are other obviously big challenges uh, that that lie ahead of us and of the industry in order to fulfil these very ambitious goals. And um, I just uh, this is probably not a complete list, and um, uh, we've uh, um, we have uh, there, there is an infinite complexity probably to this type of scaling up, um, but. Uh, just to summarize and just to make sure that we are not misunderstanding that what I'm talking about today is the only issue, we see that there are several issues. And to start with uh, regulation and uh, dependency on uh, stable legislation, the availability of resource and personnel in the authorities, international integration with uh, neighboring countries, those are all issues around the regulation. We have the issues around grid infrastructure where we can see, um, A, there is, needs to be a direct connection of all of these projects or each of these projects, but then also the hinterland grid integration, where now the power production patterns of big industrial companies, companies are changing from, for example, uh, hubs of energy production, where there was coal now to coastal uh, areas um, to, to use all that, um, um, that offshore wind um, onshore. And then there's obviously the future um, of potentially H2, which, um, which might uh, provide for further challenges of uh, actually um, bringing, the, bringing the produce to land um, or to produce it onshore. And then uh, um, there is obviously as a big, big point, the supply chain, um, which I'm not really the, the, uh, uh, the expert to speak on, but I can imagine that the sheer volume of um, of installations that needs to be put into the water will prove to be a challenge um, combined with local content provisions or needs, technology development, and also the decarbonization of production on, um, on that side, all those challenges to, um, to this uh, uh, um, huge ambition. And all of this combined uh, human resources or combined human resources, which uh, needs to be available um, um, preferably with uh, the relevant experience um, training and then in the localities where, uh, where it is needed, which will also be a huge challenge. And one further challenge, and that's what I will focus on, um, will be uh, the availability of space and um, existing uses in those spaces, environmental effects um, on, um, uh, on the areas that we are talking about, and in particular also with this increasing build out cumulative impacts of, um, uh, of, those, um, of those developments. And if we uh, look at the European map for, um, uh, for offshore wind ambition, or um, uh, in part already what has been implemented, we see that everything that is colorful on this map marks either existing projects, projects in operational construction and planning, or that are now um, looked at for potential offshore development, where it's not certain yet whether that will come or not. That's the dark blue. But um, um, we can certainly see that this relatively landlocked area in the North Sea, the EEZ, 
is going to see a significant increase in infrastructure build out. And um, obviously, the national plans are changing, but uh, we do see that this is going to become very dominant in this area. And um, especially in an area that is as landlocked as the North Sea, uh, that is heavily used both economically um, um, and also for all sorts of other use for fishing, for military, and so on. Um, um, there is uh, that will become that can become quite dense soon. And also, what we see is um, that uh, the environmental impacts, um, um, especially on an area that has all this uh, land around it, where there is a lot of migratory birds and other um, um, uh, yeah, animal activity, are obviously becoming um, an, an issue. And Another thing we're seeing here particularly is also the, uh, the need for cross-border integration and, um, and observation of this space because um, um, a lot of these impacts cannot be seen only on a national level, but obviously have um, international components that goes for environmental users and uh, or environmental impacts and the grid infrastructure, but also for, um, uh, for other users like military and so on. And so we are already seeing overlapping um, uh, utilizations of um, different areas for several users. And that is, um, uh, that is certainly something that we will see more. And um, I think this, is a, this, this will probably um, uh, become an issue not only in this particular area, I'm focusing on this because this is where we are uh, probably seeing the, um, uh, those things or those um, um, options and opportunities clash first. And um, I want to take you even one level further into the uh, German um, planning of the space, which hopefully can give you some ideas also on issues that, that will come up in other jurisdictions and um, questions um, that, that will arise there. So um, we have just seen a new spatial plan for the German EEZ, which you see here, this is only the North Sea. I've um, deliberately left out the Baltic Sea now, which looks equally crowded. Um, but the EZ is just very small there. And what we see here is uh, really the density of use uh, in the German EZ. So you see the blue areas are for shipping, the green areas are environmentally sensitive, the orange areas are, sorry, I just dropped out of my presentation, is that? Sorry, can you still see my presentation? Hang on. Yeah. Yeah, we can still see that. Yeah, no, I mean, without any ado, it just, I just dropped out of it here. Right, let me try and, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, the orange is the offshore wind, and that is also the light orange and the dark orange. And then you see the in purple, the pipes, and the white and gray striped areas are military users. So what we can see is there's no white area left in the German EEZ already now. So uh, everything is planned or utilized uh, or, or foreseen for some sort of use or some sort of um, priority um, um, in the sense of environmental uh, or so on. And um, unlocking for further space for offshore wind in Germany will largely depend, for example, on the co-utilization and or re-evaluation of existing users in order to, um, uh, to go beyond what is planned right now. And, um, and that is something that uh, uh, shows the path forward in our view. And um, I'll just uh, take you through some aspects of this um, uh, briefly. And that is, for example, this is now again, the pure offshore wind footprint. And we can see that that is like, if you consider the overall size of this, uh, that, is a significant, um, uh, that is a significant footprint. So I don't know what percentage of the whole EEZ is going to be used for offshore wind, but it's certainly double digit and, um, and it's a lot. And you can see that the uh, full orange are areas where there's uh, full run, so it's priority. Um, uh, they are very likely to be utilized with offshore wind. The others are currently blocked for offshore wind. And we also see that some of the areas that, um, uh, that are actually currently occupied with offshore wind farms, that's the EN5 and 4 on the right-hand side that you see, are not in the strongest of zonings. And that is because, for example, and that is just showing us this uh, co-use or co-zoning, um, they are priority areas for, for divers. And um, 
um, that is the new zoning and um, that means that likely for example repowering those particular areas is going to become very challenging and it shows that now with an increasing um, build out of offshore wind even those areas for offshore wind are partly re-evaluated um, um, in light of the future in light of cumulative effects of all the offshore wind farms that will come online and will be operational in the next years. And uh, we also see that um, that certain areas, the, the Dogger Bank, for example, in Germany has been a huge uh, place of discussion. It has now been zoned for a priority for nature protection, but this is only preliminary. It will be reassessed. There is a potential of four to six gigawatt there. And this is going to be uh, assessed for the viability and coexistence of nature protection and offshore wind. So this is another example of, uh, of this type of coexisting uh, coexistence. This will largely depend on cumulative effects. It also shows how important international integration and cooperation will be here because uh, the Dogger Bank is not only in Germany, but it also stretches into Denmark and into, uh, into the UK EZ. So um, uh, this is um, uh, this is going to be um, this shows both the co-utilization and um, also the um, need for international coordination. Another point to illustrate this is um, uh, is that something quite innovative which we found. So this is um, another type of area. This is now in the Baltic Sea where um, corridors for migratory birds movement has been has been implemented and. This is not prohibitive to offshore wind. However, already on the planning level and in the zoning level, it foresees that during particular uh, migratory bird events, the, um, the offshore wind farms will have to be taken out of the wind and will be switched off. So this is also a very interesting tool to, um, uh, to have a coexistence of nature protection and of offshore wind. Um, this time implemented through a very particular um, 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 measure that is already on the zoning level for seeing uh, potential uh, periods of switch off. Um, and then I want to show you this. This is, for example, um, a this are, those are military users that are currently um, banning any type of offshore wind development. And there, one could look at it from the other perspective and ask the question: Isn't there an opportunity to maybe? reuse that space and reassess it against um, the actual cost of, um, um, uh, of the development of offshore wind further off the coast because these areas are clearly quite attractive because they're much closer to the coast than a lot of the offshore wind development that is happening and couldn't there be a reassessment of what is actually needed and if all this area is actually needed for military use then there could potentially also be a, um, an opportunity to co-utilize that space because um, uh, because there are um, uh, they are not really conflicting users. So this is an example of also an opportunity um, um, in this space. And uh, with this, I will already come to the conclusion because I think this was just to illustrate some core points about how co-utilization can be um, uh, can be uh, managed and how space can be found for offshore wind even in dense areas. And um, uh, that's why I also want to include next to the challenges that come with that, some opportunities. So the challenge is clear, it's the limit of space and the conflicts of use that um, may limit the potential of certain areas. However, what we're also seeing is that other users could allow for that reutilization and that it would even make sense to maybe look at users that have been there before offshore wind has been there and see to what extent they are actually needed and if there cannot be very viable and very feasible areas um, that are currently used differently that can be unlocked for offshore wind. The other point was the intergovernmental and international planning, uh, which is re required to, have to, to really be honest about the sustainable path and protection of goods, including environment. Um, but then again, there also the opportunity is that this international um, uh, planning can finally lead to a better cross-border planning of infrastructure, um, in particular with grid infrastructure, and um, thereby um, the meshed offshore grid, the energy islands, also lead to a better um, uh, to a better offtake situation for existing projects and for future projects, and thus increase the value of the product. And the next point is the last point is the consideration of cumulative effects and the projects that. Um, 
may be facing um, uh, uncertainty currently uh, as to operational restrictions, which we are also seeing. Like if you don't have the knowledge of what future users uh, will be potentially restricted, and if you will have switch off times as for migratory bird events, it's much better to know that before. So that is the corresponding um, opportunity here. If we can unlock nature uh, or areas that are sensitive from, from a nature protection um, perspective, maybe um, uh, determining that ahead of the tender is quite helpful to create a level playing field and allow for this not to actually really impact the envisaged business case, um, uh, but, uh, but to be transparent about that. And all in all, and this is probably the largest of the opportunities behind this kind of um, um, planning um, tools and looking at it from these perspectives, is that a um, resolving those conflicts of use and resolving those issues and priorities early in the planning process might be one very important piece of the puzzle for um, very much accelerating permit procedures, which are in Germany and I think also in other countries key to a rapid rollout of offshore wind. So those are my thoughts on this. Um, in the limited amount of time that we have, I hope you um, uh, you enjoyed uh, uh, this little presentation. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, sure. uh, excellent. Thank you very much, Felix, for this very comprehensive overview of the uh, development challenges in Germany, especially. Uh, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Yuka Toma. Uh, Yuka, over to you. Yuka, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Uh, let me share my slide. Wait a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, can you please send the request again? Yes, sure. Thank you. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ilya, for a kind introduction, and thank you, uh, Alice, for the presentations. And so, my name is Yuka. Uh, my name is Yuka, uh, working for Renova Renewable Energy Developer in Japan. And this is Masahiro Yoshida, uh, he is co-head of engineering department. He will talk about offshore wind development challenges in Japan after my introduction of the company and government policy in Japan. And there'll be one more presenta presenter from us, Mel Miyabe. He will join at the QA session later. So, uh, First of all, uh, thank you for inviting us to this great event today. Uh, this is today's agenda. Uh, I will introduce uh, about our company first and government, Japanese government policy for offshore wind. And lastly, offshore wind development challenges in Japan. So starting from introduction, Venova is listed company specialized in development and operation of renewable energies such as solar, wind, biomass, geothermal, and small hydro. And Renova was founded in Tokyo in 2000 and has made continuous growth. And now we have more than 200 colleagues working together for further development of renewable energy and offshore wind project in, uh, is our focus now. <clears throat> And currently, we are expanding our business in Asia, and there are some projects under development in Vietnam, Philippines, Korea, and the others. And now we have three subsidiaries in Singapore, Korea, and in Vietnam, and planning for a few more. So moving to the next slide, for those who are not very much familiar to uh, current Japan's offshore wind situation, I would like to briefly explain the Japanese government's energy policy with regard to offshore wind power. 
So last year, our government set a goal of achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. And there is currently a lot of discussion in Japan about making renewable energy a mainstream power source. And they see Osho Wind as the key to make it happen. The government's targets for introducing offshore wind projects were disclosed at the end of last year. Uh, they target to increase capacity to 10 gigawatts by 2030 and 30 to 45 gigawatts by 2040, including floating offshore wind. Since Japan has a vast territorial sea and exclusive economic zone, Japan Wind Power Association estimates installation potential of fixed bottom wind is 128 gigawatt and that of the floating is expected to be 424 gigawatt. So to promote offshore wind, an auction system was created by the government to select the operator to occupy each specific sea area designated by the government. For the next 10 years, the government will designate approximately one gigawatt of offshore wind promotion zones annually for the auction. And last year was actually the start of the first round auction. And there were four series designated and we also participated in one of them as a lead sponsor. And that project is located in Yuri Honjo Akita, uh, which is northern part of Japan. And we have been studying this area for the past six years and have been in a dialogue, dialogue with the local government and the fisheries. And uh, we just submitted the plan for the auction in this May, and we are now on the section process. The operator will be selected in a few months. And this is just for the reference. Uh, these are current status on designation of promotion zones and selection of promising zones, promising zones. Uh, once promotion zone is designated, that's where the auction will be carried out and other zones are still under the discussion. And uh, that's all about brief of policies. And now let's move on to the main topic. I pass the speaking to you. Hi, uh, my name is Masahiro Yoshida from Renova Incorporate. Uh, you can see the slide. This slide, yeah, yeah. You can see the slide. There, there are a bunch of the challenges that need to be addressed. So, the, but you know, the offshore wind market in Japan is just baby. The, so, I assume that this is not surprise for you. And in this webinar, now I'd like to pick up three topics and explain that we think what we are do, dealing to forward uh, development in the offshore wind business in Japan. Yes, next slide. Yes. As indicated in the guideline of the auction in Japan, there are national and regional needs for the offshore wind power, as represented by supply price, uh, project uh, implementation capacity, and their economic impact on country and region. In order to meet these requirements, we are focusing on the following points in our business plan. Contribution to the local community, the reasonable and future price, and the design uh, to suit Japan's environment. Yes, next slide, please. Yeah, the first read, uh, I'd like to mention why contribution to local communities is important to develop uh, projects in Japan. In general, the, the fishery industry is a major stakeholder in offshore wind projects, but it is particularly important in the current auction system in Japan for two reasons. Uh, first, the development of a centralized system is currently in the demonstration stage. So the consensus building with local stakeholders is depending on the developers for now. In the first place, unless the consensus can be reached with local fishing co cooperatives with the fishing rights, the area will not be designated for the auction. In addition, the further offshore you go, the more numbers of interested parties across uh, prefectures, meaning that consequence building come out to be even more complicated. So the, this is also a very, very important perspective in case of floating offshore wind. Uh, coping with uh, this uh, situation for now, that we think 
it's important for us to engage with local fisheries well. And that was actually one of the lessons we learned from Yuri Honjo project by going through careful of com careful communication and several research of offshore wind impact on fish to explain it has been the possibility of becoming a fishing ground. Please see the photo in the right. So this is the results of the real fish ground test in Yuri Honjo, which we did. Next, please. Yes, next thing that we need to do in order to achieve both price and business feasibility is to run engineering knowledge from Europe and other countries that are ahead of us. The offshore wind industry, uh, which is expected to grow rapidly in Japan. Our current task is to have human resources with a wealth of experience and the knowledge of projects. We uh, recruit these people and in our previous project, advanced human resources are working on the frontal lines of engineering. The next most important thing is the ability to respond to the specific challenges of the season in, uh, in order to create a feasible business plan considering environmental conditions unique to Japan, such as earthquakes, tsunami, typhoon, and the lightning. By accumulating know-how within the company, we aim to reduce costs and shorten the construction period through owner's engineering. In addition, the, we hope to contribute to the continuous reduction, reduction of LCOE by developing our know-how at speedy and advanced level for the next project as well. Next, yeah. Another perspective uh, we need to consider in terms of environmental condition unique in Japan is water depth. Although Japan has a vast uh, territorial sea and economic exclusive zone, its coast is surrounded by a vast con continental shelf with water depths ranging from 50 to 200 meters, and the uh, topography of the water suddenly becomes very deep. Uh, you can see the right picture. Uh, you can find right blue line and blue line and uh, deep blue line. This right blue line shows 20 meter depth, and the blue line shows uh, 50 meter depth, and the uh, right, deep blue line shows 100 meter depth. So the ones the go from coast or uh, around 10 kilometers, the uh, just water depths become 100 meters. So that means the uh, just fixed foundation area is very narrow. Uh, so the, we need to consider the, how to utilize the offshore uh, floating foundation for the, these uh, areas. So the uh, promotion of the floating offshore wind development is also important challenge for us. And we are also working on feasibility study with domestic and overseas partners right now. The, in addition, the, we believe uh, that our admission to the WFO is one of the very important milestones for the development of our pro floating projects. Uh, we are looking forward to uh, sharing the knowledge and uh, discuss further challenges through WFO activities. Uh, in closing, the offshore wind challenges are very different country to country. So I hope now uh, you got better understanding of current situation and the challenges in Japan. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, great. Thank you very much, Yuk and Masahira, for this very insightful presentation and sharing your knowledge from, about Japan. Uh, yeah, very much appreciated. Uh, and now it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce our final speaker for today, um, David uh, Karaskoza. David, over to you. Okay, can, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, very good. So um, thank you thank you again to, to WFO for, for the invitation to, to SciTech or for SciTech to, to present what we, what we are doing uh, in Spain and, and also what the, the, what's the, the challenges we are envisioning for, for the development here. But I, I would like to first go through a, a quick introduction to, to SciTech offshore for those who, who don't know us yet, we 
are a, a business unit from, from the CITE group. And it's a business unit created and launched to uh, boost the, the floating, floating offshore wind uh, development through the company and mainly related to the, the patent, uh, the, the platform uh, we, we developed. So we, we are now more than 35 uh, engineers and, and professionals working on, on the, the company, on the spin-off. And we are now involved in, in several projects uh, from prototypes to commercial uh, developments and, and tenders. I would say all, all around the, the world uh, with say main activity for prototyping in Spain, but then on, on the pre-commercial and commercial activity, we've got quite a, let's say a vast footprint as you can see in the, in the map. But let's say that I would like to move quickly and also on the benefit of, of time to what we are doing at the moment and which are the next steps uh, from, from now, now on. And, and then to say having a more peaceful uh, yeah, kind of way to, to, to explain what we're doing at the moment, uh, I'll be playing a short video about the, the Demosat project. This is the, the demonstration project we, we are working at the moment, we are working on at the moment. Uh, it's, it's actually the platform we are manufacturing also as we speak in the port of Bilbao. And uh, this floating platform uh, with a turbine of uh, two megawatt will be installed next year, next summer, of the coast of, of Bilbao, becoming the first floating offshore wind connected to the, to the Spanish grid and also the first, uh, the first offshore wind turbine uh, to be installed in mainland Spain. There's one, one demonstration project of the Canary Island. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we are still in the, the very first stages of the, the offshore wind development in, in, in Spain. But it's, it's also true that we, we are, uh, say, seeing some signs of great, um, say, yeah, say great steps towards commercial offshore wind of the coast of, of Spain, as, as I'll, I'll, be I'll be Spain afterwards. Just a few figures for the projects. Uh, this is uh, a, a two megawatt project. We will, we expect to generate the energy equivalent to the consumption of 2000 households in Spain. Due to the, the fact that uh, the, the, the floater is mainly made out of concrete, the local content is boosting uh, and, and, and it's representing, let's say, 75% of the, the, the awarded contracts uh, to be in the, in the area nearby. The distance to shore is two nautical miles and, and the platform will be installed in, a, in an existing test center called BIMED. And just to, to keep on going with the, the project uh, itself, just uh, an, an, an update on, on what's the, the current status. Well, that's actually the status early, early summer this, this year in the, the construction site. We are partnering with RWG in this project and, and Ferrovial is the, the main construction uh, partner, well, not partner, the subcontractor. And yeah, we'll, we'll see a, yeah, a few footage from the, the construction site where you can see the, the the different pieces, the different sections of the of the floater being uh, being manufactured. Uh, let's say that we are planning for we've planned for for a precasted methodology for for construction, so to represent what the, the construction for industrial projects will will look like. This is a, a floater made out of concrete mainly, but also uh, using steel inside to to stiffen the, the, the bulkheads inside the, the hulls. It's a catamaran ship shaped platform. And well, the, the construction is progressing very well. We are we're demonstrating also uh, the the rates for, for construction, uh, how we we are we are planning also uh, to, to do things in, in pre-commercial and, and commercial uh, wind farms. At the moment, uh, the construction is a bit more advanced than, than you can see in the video. The, all, all the precasted elements have been already 
uh, already casted and, and manufactured. And we are now approaching the, the final, say, assembly operation of the different precasted sections, like if it was a puzzle, and and uh, that that operation is is and, and will be happening in the the coming weeks. Finally, the the whole the whole platform tower and turbine will be assembled onshore for a final uh, launching and let's say mobile mobilization and, and launching uh, in the port. Okay, so very very interesting project going at the moment. But that's let's say what's what's happening at the moment, and, and now I'd like to to speak a bit about what's um, say what's what's next, right? And for us, uh, the project that's actually next is the project that we've called Geroa. Uh, is actually future in in the Basque language, but it's also the acronym for Green Energy Search for Oz Offshore Atlantic. This is a, a pre-commercial wind farm development uh, it's a probably a phase a phase two uh, compared to to the the demonstration project i've just shown because it's it's also more or less in the in the same area in the same in the same region but this one is obviously using full commercial uh, offshore wind turbines we are planning now to use three uh, 15 megawatt turbines this is a project to be commissioned on 2025, we we will be using existing onshore substation and well as as a let's say pre-commercial or commercial wind farm, the uh, the operation is expected to to last for for 25 years. Now that we've shaped a bit the uh, let's say what we've been doing, what we will be doing, uh, I would like to speak a bit about what's been the, the development challenges to date and, and also the, the development challenges we envision from, from now on, uh, mostly based in, in Spain. So first, speaking about the zoning, uh, I would like to, to bring the, the example, the current example of the, the Garoa project, where we first selected an area to be studied, and, and this is an, an area uh, where we defined well, being at least 10 kilometers, I mean, uh, being at least five kilometers uh, off the coast uh, for yeah, so social acceptance and visual impact. Uh, then a maximum depth for now of 200 meters. And then that's, that's actually also the, the area of, of study. Then if we go to the right picture, then we start to, uh, yeah, to plot the, the critical, the potential critical constraints. And in yellow there, you can see uh, an area which is a specific, uh, it's an area for, for a specific protection for bears. And, and then we also said, well, to avoid any potential indirect impact from, from there, we will, uh, we will draw a line five kilometers from there. So, so to have a, a perimeter, uh, a safety perimeter and the same from from the coast so so we said let's say let's be at least 10 kilometers from from the shore uh, also for uh, for potential impacts then uh, we've got some other potential constraints which is the navigation channels the fisheries and and, and some some other some other impacts we've we've been analyzing and then we start to see which is actually the the most feasible area for the development of a, of a wind farm in in the area of, of study once we did that then we uh, start to to study the different layout options uh, and and also the the cabling layout potential as you see well what we called the option 1a is an option with three um offshore wind turbines uh, with a cable yeah cable routing which is going uh, on a sandy seabed and gravel seabed and, and then it will be connected to to the existing uh, offshore electrical infrastructure in bimap in the test center where, where actually the demonstration will be the demonstration project will be located so that's let's say the process we we've been following and and now we 
uh, I would like to, to quickly mention the the great challenges we we have in Spain at the moment. Well, the the momentum is is obviously now for for offshore wind discussions in 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 Spain as the as the as for the first time in in the marine spatial planning in Spain offshore wind is is being taken into serious consideration and areas for for the development and deployment of offshore wind uh, are now being proposed but i'm just bringing these these few pictures uh, to yeah get a bit of an understanding of how difficult it is to to set out I mean, three areas for for offshore wind because we we still have quite a yeah say quite a reluctancy to to many other sectors and that's that's the the discussion which is going on and actually the this this marine maritime spatial planning proposal is a still on draft version and uh, let's say a final version is, is still to be to be to be defined we we also have the let's say the, the other points that are obviously of, of key uh, importance which is the, the the wind resource and and the navigation channel along with the yeah the interface with the with the fisheries right so uh, in the roadmap regulation and and, and funding opportunities uh, we see that some important uh, steps are, are being taken and that's the definition of this draft version of uh, of roadmap which is now establishing one to three gigawatts to be installed by 2030 but if we want this kind of uh, amount of, of gigawatts to be installed we need to speed up into the regulation which is still in progress and also on the definition for commercial tenders it's it's tricky and, and it's difficult because it's a completely new market for for spain but at the same time we think we've got a strong supply chain strong players that will be able to to boost for for these i i actually point out that yeah so the supply chain uh, in other words can can be uh, let's say can can cause some some kind of challenges but the truth is that We've got a, a, a supply chain for for export of offshore wind, and now uh, let's say that that we we see uh, we see flowing offshore wind as the, the next natural step. We need to look at port infrastructure, and we need also to to look as I said to, to the social response and how how we interact with tourism, fisheries, etc. And just last slide, it's a, a slide I, I would like to to share with you, which is I mean, quite useful to see why the port infrastructure and the space in ports is so important. And that's uh, an example uh, representation we, we did uh, comparing a 10 megawatt float, a floater uh, with the, the, lo the local stadium, football stadium in, in, in Bilbao. So this is the, the big elements, the, the big um, technologies that, that we will be manufacturing and, and developing by dozens, so yeah, it's it's also a great challenge to to face, and that's all for me. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, David, for this uh, very insightful presentation, and also including uh, the videos, which was quite nice to watch. Thank you very much. So now we have approximately uh, ten minutes, and we received a few questions. So maybe we'll start with the general questions first, and then we'll see how we'll go in terms of the time. So the first question is about um, what are the current and most pressing development challenges in uh, the offshore wind industry? So maybe we start with Renova team first, since we have quite a, quite a team, uh, then Felix and then uh, David. Uh, Renova, Tim, are you here? No. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the from the Master Hero, the, now the, we show the uh, just the challenges uh, of the offshore wind in Japan. 
and uh, of course all of them is uh, very important uh, but uh, for the uh, renova so the uh, the, for the for the renova for not for the uh, Japanese market but the, for the renova the number one is uh, our one of the challenges the building consensus with the local communities because the uh, if the, we can't make this uh, consensus with the local economy uh, local uh, economy and the local uh, team so that we can't go forward anymore so the, for the other developers the, this is a very very important for us in in Japan. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, I tried to highlight one one of the issues that we see, especially for for a, a sustainable uh, development of a very strong sector in, in Germany, and um, and I tried to also touch on the other issues that we see. And um, which one is the single biggest is, I think, quite hard to say, and probably depends a little bit on the jurisdiction and on the specific project. I mean. We can say that in Germany um, there was a lack of ambition, um, in my perspective, over the last uh, over the last years. That was probably the biggest challenge, and that's why we haven't installed any capacity this year yet. Um, we are seeing that um, uh, happening now, and the, um, or that being resolved, and we hopefully will see more production um, and installation in the in the near future because projects are coming um, uh, are coming to construction that have been. Successful in the previous tenders for them, obviously. For example, the aerocent bits are, a big, um, are probably a big challenge. Uh, they need to contract that electricity. We see that that's underway, but um, but that would be a challenge. And then um, I would say, with a uh, with a really expected growth, um, uh, all of the issues that we've heard from the from the colleagues and that we've mentioned earlier: supply so chain, human resource, spatial planning, um, regulatory bodies catching up. Uh, um, uh, learning and, and, and having the resource simply to, to, to um, uh, digest those permitting processes and the planning processes um, and the green infrastructure, I think, is, is going to remain a, a, a big challenge to the commercial um, um, development, especially if we ramp up capacity as it is envisaged, then um, the suit link that, for example, we have in Germany is not going to be enough. You know, we need to have the offshore grid, we need to integrate that. We need to um, um, and really adapt the, uh, the hinterland infrastructure. Okay, thank you, Felix. David? No, yeah, I would completely agree with, with my, my colleagues. Uh, I would just emphasize that the fact that um, we see, uh, let's say, the European and probably in a, in a worldwide level, uh, the port infrastructure has been quite a hot topic and, and quite a challenge if we want to install gigawatts and, and gigawatts at the same time in, in many countries. Let's say that uh, we, we need to be prepared for that, not only on the infrastructure, but also on the on the supply chain. And there are there is always obviously this this good uh, approach of, of having both concrete and, and steel solutions so we can mobilize different supply chains. Uh, but yeah from the heavy lifting to the, the port themselves, to the installation of vessels. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously we, we need to, to think on, on the, the whole picture and, and not only on, on the roadmaps and, and the big figures, right? But uh, yeah, I would say that. And then on the specific case on in Spain, again, mm, we need to have regulation, stability, and kind of a fixed uh, or established pathway uh, to to the development. Otherwise, uh, we we will have only good words and and nothing will happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. That's great. So the next question is also quite general, and um, that's about floating. So what are the most prominent floating of showing developing challenges, and possibly we can discuss briefly the main difference between the bottom fixed in terms of strategy, failure, and scope? And I think this is especially an uh, interesting question for our Japanese uh, team and also in Spain. Uh, and maybe this time Felix first, then uh, David, and then Renova team. Well, I, will, I think we use the time and speak to the people that are actually implementing this. I mean, I'm happy to give my two cents on that, but I think uh, I would hand that over to you, Ben, David, for, uh, for to answer that. Yeah, sounds great. 
Okay. No, no, yeah. What what we are seeing at at the moment is um, a great ambition for for floating wind to to be developed for many from from many countries, but at the same time a great ambition for those countries to develop local content. So that's good and and that's very interesting for for the local communities and and for the uh, the development of the employment. But we we need also to to think how to do that, right? Um, and let's say if we think on, on Scotland, um, there's no too much shipyards. There is uh, potential for, for concrete concrete floaters, but at the same time, we will see several several opportunities, both for, for concrete and, and steel. And we, if we want to, to emphasize that, that local content, well, uh, there is, uh, again, and I'm sorry for repeating myself, but again, uh, uh, let's say a, a boost of the, the supply chain is, is required there. Same for, for France and, and same for, for the, the countries that are, are coming coming afterwards. So probably there's also an interesting view from, from Renova side. So I will let them speak also about this, this topic. Thank you, David. Yeah, Renova team, what are your thoughts about uh, floating? Yes. The, uh, so the, uh, maybe the same as the uh, European side, but the uh, challenges for the offshore in Japan, uh, so the challenge for the floating in Japan is the uh, uh, port, or, port or capability capacity and uh, also the supply chain. So the most of the uh, good port, big port is already occupied in Japan. So, and also the uh, depths of the uh, key side is not so deep in Japan. So once the, we want to uh, produce many of the uh, this floating foundation in Japan, uh, very difficult to uh, find for us uh, to execute the, this uh, production of the floating foundation. And in addition, uh, we uh, difficult, difficult to, we, 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 we difficult to find the uh, good uh, supply chain for the floating foundation in Japan at this moment. But as I mentioned, the, we already uh, talked with uh, domestic and uh, global uh, floating foundation supplier at this moment, and uh, we try to solve the, these challenges uh, at this moment. Yep. Okay, but the, perfect. Still, the port is issue for us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Understand. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the next question would be, what's uh, what the floating uh, or oh, sorry, what the offshore wind industry co uh, could learn from other industries? One person mentioned that in some countries, specifically in the UK, was mentioned that the industry seemed to be reluctant to take on board the experience from the oil industry. So, what are your thoughts on that? Maybe David first, then Renova team, and then Felix. Well. Uh the truth is that we we will and we are learning quite a lot from from oil and gas suppliers. I, I would also like to to mention the, the fact that uh, the decarbonization of of existing oil and gas assets is also a very interesting opportunity for pre-commercial developments in in flood and offshore wind, and and that's something we are we are seeing worldwide, uh, but most most recently in, in Scotland with uh, this call for expression of interest for, for projects um, linking floating of the wind to, to existing oil and gas assets. Uh, and the combination there, uh, with, which can, can sound a bit ironic, right? Because you are helping uh, to produce oil and gas, but well, let's, let's say that, that we will still need oil, we will still need gas for a very long time. So let's de decarbonize those operations, right? So if, if we can partner on, on these kind of projects, we will learn from each other. And that will obviously have very interesting outcomes for then the commercial uh, opportunities. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, um, Renova team, Yuka, Masahiro, Neil. The, in Japan, uh, you know that uh, we, uh, our Japanese, didn't have the, uh, this oil and gas uh, industry, uh, very few uh, experience for in Japan. But on the other hand, the, we can uh, 
uh, we might be able to utilize the, uh, just the industry for the shipbuilding and uh, some other mass production for the automotive. Yeah, I was in Denmark and I was uh, manufacturing uh, in image vessels before, and from my experience, uh, I think the Japanese industry uh, might be able to be utilized uh, for the, uh, this uh, Nasser assembly and some other uh, industry for sure. But uh, in addition, uh, I think that this shipbuilding industry uh, can uh, support the uh, production of the uh, floating foundation. This floating foundation and uh, this shipbuilding is very similar. So I think if the, we go to the, this floating foundation industry, uh, a Japanese shipbuilding industry uh, is very helpful for us. Yep. Thank you very much. And uh, Felix. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> I think um, it's an interesting question, but I think the industry has gotten better at that. Um, and um, I think that we will, um, with the um, with the constraints on human resource, that will even increase. I think that uh, we are seeing a lot of people from that sector changing over to the offshore wind sector, and there could be more still. But I think there is a national pull, and the and the, and the industry is just so dynamic now that I think that's going to happen more. I mean, I had a senior associate from my team. I had a way to be a program head for offshore wind farms. I mean, I'm sure there's better people than lawyers to do that. But I mean, I take it as a compliment for our very business-minded training that we do. But I mean, it's, uh, it's you see that there is a lot of uh, pull on the human resource side, I think. And the other thing is that we're seeing is, in my opinion, with the opening towards age two, the attention also on their side has really become much more serious and, uh, and much more um, real. You know, I mean, we see that Aquaventus in Germany is a joint venture of Inter Alia, um, RWE and, and Shell, you know, so, so um, I think it's also that the oil majors are like after they have for a while spoken about it now really are coming to the table and um, um, and also looking into this because they uh, they recognize the familiarities with their with their trading operations with their industries and it's, they're seeing that their future is in derivative products of green electricity now and I think that's going to help that too. Perfect, Felix. Thank you very much. And also, uh, thank you very much to all of you for your answers and sharing views today. That's already bring us to the end of the webinar, unfortunately, today. Uh, please uh, join us next month. Um, the following webinar will be uh, in, in November, on November 10th, actually, at the same time, 1 to 2 p.m. And the topic of the webinar is offshore wind uh, market updates on Poland, Norway, and France. So thank you very much, David, Felix, Yuka, Masahiro, and Neil for your time today. Thanks everyone for attending this session. Have a great rest of the day, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.